Welcome to the Linguava podcast, The Invisible Profession, where we give you tools, tips, and resources in medical interpretation and translation that help bring to life our industry and ultimately help improve health outcomes for the limited English proficient communities. Welcome to episode number five. Today I'm going to speak with someone who has a story of resilience, of determination, of hard work, and someone who has left uh, an incredible impact here on the uh, the Mayan community all throughout throughout the U.S. and continues just to to blaze the trail for, for Mayan interpreters bringing awareness and raising the level of professionalism for for Mayan interpreters and the Mayan community. I'm going to be interviewing today Carmelina Cadena. She is a Maya Acateco woman born in San Miguel, Acatan, um, Guatemala. And she had to grow up very, very fast, fleeing fleeing Guatemala at a very young age uh, because of the war, coming here with nothing but the clothes on her back, with her family, without knowing the language, and being able to maneuver that with, with her family and eventually learning a total of nine that's right, I said nine languages, um, becoming a, a well, well-known well Mayan interpreter as well as someone who's been able to train hundreds of, of interpreters and continues to, to do so. So we're gonna, today we're going to unpack a little bit more about the Mayan culture. Uh, for us as medical providers, what, are we, what should we be thinking about when working with the Mayan culture and also for interpreters as well to, to best determine which which language is going to be to be best. So it is a complete honor and pleasure to have Carmelina today on the show with us. Carmelina, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Welcome to the show. Well, good afternoon or good morning to wherever you're listening <laughs> to. Um, well, thank you, David. I mean, I know it's been a long process of back and forth between you and I because of course, you're busy, and I'm just as busy myself. And so, but I really appreciate the invitation, and I I hope that I can share a lot of information that'll help our colleagues and providers and anyone that listens to this podcast because it's very important information to have, and it it helps um, you understand our community, and it helps us so that we can open up to um, people that are from outside of our community too. And that's what it's all about, right, is, is being able to, and that's why we have this podcast, to get people dialoguing about important topics that are going to ultimately help bring health equity through, through language access. And that's, that's why we're here. And so I want, I want the audience today to learn a little bit more about, about you and, and, and your story. So let's, so let's, start, let's start there. Can you give, give me a little bit more of a, of a, of a background on, on your your upbringing and, and your, your start there in, uh, in, in San Miguel, Acatan. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, one March and back in the seventies, I'm not going to say exactly <laughs> the year cause you know, I'm trying to stay young, <laughs> but, um, the, I was, you know, born into a normal, uh, Acateco, um, Mayan family. Um, my parents were hardworking people. Um, they would travel to, the um, farms or the estates where they would go and they would pick um, um, coffee so that they can have money and provide for a little family. And, you know, eventually they were able to buy land and they were able to build a a house made out of adobe um, with a tin roof. And that was our home. And when I came into the world, um, I was born in a house where um, it was, it was made out of, um, how should I say it? Um, it's like, um, I don't know how to say it, but it's made out of just mm-hmm. sticks. Um, so then eventually I was able to, we, you know, my parents had their home. And, and so then we were, we were able to move to um, our new home. And, and I grew up there in that house. And my mom had farm animals, you know, she had mm-hmm. pigs and she raised um chickens and so it was very normal up until I was four years old um the death of my grandmother came when I was four years old and that kind of started marking um where my life started to change and my grandmother was really in touch with her with her surroundings and 
she would always tell my mom, you know, like, you need to take her far away. I don't know where you're, where you're going to go, but you just need to go far away from here. You need to leave this, this place and, because if not, you know, um, something's just gonna, not going to be well. And, and as soon as my grandmother passes away, the, the army and the soldiers came to our village and um, they came to San Miguel and they started going off into the villages and, and that was the, you know, like the time where everything started going downwards. Yeah. Um, you know, that's the time where we had to start going, uh, hiding. Um, we would hide under rocks, under, in a cave, um, in the woods. I remember my parents practicing many times when they said, you know, if we have to run, we're going to all run each way, you know, as fast, fast as we can, whether you're with your dad or we're with me. Um, we, you know, you, I need you to listen to me. If I tell you, you need to hide, you need to hide and you need to stay under whatever brush I put you under. I need you to stay under there. And, and at this that was point, like, you're, I was, you're, you're, you're four or five years old at this point. I'm four years, I'm still four years old at this point, And I'm learning my, you know, basically now that I am an older adult, I'm learning how to survive, you know, and I'm four years old. And this is, this is, this is how I went from being four and I would say I jumped to my teenage years. Like I, I missed that. Like from birth to four years old, I was a normal child. But as soon as that hit, I just became a teenager. And then after that, I just became an adult. I mean, by the time I was, when I reached my teen years, you know, when I, you know, I, I was 13 years old, I was already like an adult yeah. because I had to grow up fast. You know, yeah. like I had to, adapt to my environment and I, I had to just you know and as when we came to this country I, I had to learn the language and I had to start interpreting for my mom and so you know that was my upbringing in my country and and eventually we were really um you know uh we were blessed uh, is, the, is the correct word to say because we were able to get away a right. lot of people didn't a lot of people from my dad's family Basically, I'm, you know, like in my dad's family, the only people that are left are my uh, his two uncles and my dad and me. That's 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 the family. That's his immediate family. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Everybody else, uncles, aunts, um, cousins, everybody was killed during this war. And so, and the same thing happened on my mom's side. So, like, it was like, they're dying here. They're dying here. We need to get away because this is not going to be safe for us. So, you know, my my dad had to leave fast sooner um, because um, he was uh, kidnapped um, two times. And, and when the, he was able to escape the last time he was able to escape, he just left. Like, but they had already spoken. They had already made their plans and they had already kind of like, you know, said, if we do get away and if I have to leave, we can find each other here. I'll wait for you such and such time. If you don't find me, then just render me dead because you know, you're never going to find me. And so that's how it happened. And, you know, my, my dad was gone. He was taken. And then my mom, then, then they came to the house and they shot her at our house. We had already left. And, um, and so we, we got away. And then the only thing that I remember is that my mom went back inside the house to just kind of open the pen where the pig was and to open mm -hmm. the doors where the chickens were, the coop, and just let them be, you know, like let, set them free. The last thing she did was grab a, a thermos of coffee and some um, some dried tortillas, and that was it. That's what we took on our journey to leave. Wow. That was it. And we left. And, and when we – it took a while for us to, to get out of our country, of course. Yeah. And eventually we made it to the border between Guatemala and Mexico. We were able to cross over, and, um, and we made it to Mexico, my parents were able to find each other and then we started a journey to come to the United States. But all that, like there's many months between all that. And so that's why I say, you know, like I grew up so fast because like yeah. one day, yeah. one day was not even a day. One day seemed like a month and a week was like a year. And so it just went so quick. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And then, so you're, you get to the United States, you're, you're, you're seven years old and, and where, where did you um, arrive to initially? 
We um we came to uh, Nogales, Arizona, mm-hmm. and after so many, I mean, it wasn't the first time that we came to this country, and and we we all know that all immigrants have a different story, and unfortunately, mine wasn't. I mean, I wish I could say, yeah, they stamped my visa, and I was able to come to this country like just like anyone, you know, like that can fly to this country. My situation is not that, and I hope nobody judges me because of that, but. It, you know, we came, uh, we tried to come a couple of times and it didn't happen. We, we just didn't make it. One time we were left for dead in the, uh, Sonorita, the Sonoran Desert in a place called Sonorita. It was close to there, to, so close to, um, Phoenix. Mm-hmm. I mean, not Phoenix, Tucson, I'm sorry. Um, near Ajo. I know that, I know that much. That's, they, they, we walked through that and the person that was bringing us said, we're, you know, I'm going to, I'll be back. They didn't come back three days later. My father was like, no, we need a, we need, we, we can't be here. So, um, started looking for a way out. We walked all the way back to Mexico. And then, um, but this time my mom's like, you know what? I'm done. Like, we're not going to do this anymore. Yeah. We're going to cross. We're going to, we, we know our way around. Um, my parents have been traveling in our, within my country, had been traveling within my country many years with no GPS, no map, maps, no nothing. I mean, they were able to get around. Yeah. So she's like, that's, there's, there's no difference. We're going North. I mean, the United States is North and that's why we call it El Norte, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so then, you know, we're going North and that's it, you know, we're going to make it. Um, and then we just, it, we just started our journey and we made it. Um, we were processed by immigration and they, and they just, we were, they were like, you know what, we're going to tell them our story. You know, if they don't believe us and they send us back, you know, at mm-hmm. least we gave it a try. We'll start, we'll try to start an, a life somewhere else. And, and it, if it's, you know, if the United States is not for us, it's not for us, you know. So they, you know, they said, hey, we're, not, we're, we're here because there's a war in our country and we're trying to flee. We're trying to save our lives. This is what happened. And my mom told everything as much as she could, you know, like not, you know, she, I wish I could say she was able to convey the entire story. Of course not. Because I read the the asylum petition mm-hmm. several years later. I was able to read it as I, as I became a teenager. Um, I was able to read it and I was like, my goodness, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that it even was able to be accepted because yeah. it was so simple. Like it was just like a few words it, instead of like the entire story. <laughs> yeah. It was like one line, you know, one yeah. sentence, but we were, we were detained and we were put in shelters. Um, eventually they, there were, because there was no interpreter, um, they, they, they released, they released us. So, and so in that, we in that were, situation where your mom, mom's communicating, were, were you in, interpreting the best, best that you could in that situation? How much English did you have at, at that point? That moment not at that point no i had not i had not even i mean i just kept listening to what they were saying and i could hear them say you know the, the you know like name 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 i could hear that i'm like man what are they saying you know like what does name mean and i kept trying to figure out what they were meaning but it was it was you know, I, I had no my mom or my dad none of them had no no not even like they weren't even fluent in spanish so English was like really, um, and you know, it's an alien language at that point for us. Mm-hmm. And so, um, uh, we, we, you know, we were released and then, um, we were, we stayed in Arizona in Chandler. Um, but before that, we also were, we, we lived in, in Chandler Heights. Um, we lived in the Orange Groves because we, they, we didn't, they didn't have money, you know, they didn't have any money so that they could afford a place of their own. And you don't just go and say, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm, I want a lease," and you know, um, uh, it's, it's not that easy. You know, when you don't have any money, you, there's nothing, there's nothing else you can do. So um, that happened, and you know, they were eventually were able to rent a room from another couple, and that's how we started living inside, in, under under a roof, inside a home, and then, um, and, and then after that, that's when I that. And they they found me because I was going to the to the field with my parents, and um, someone um, was like, "No, you, your daughter needs to be in school. Like, this is the United mm-hmm. States. Like, and you you have to put your children in school here." And so then my parents were like, "Okay, you know, we're not going to put you in school because they were afraid that if they would put me in school and they got deported, what would happen? I was going to be in school, right?" Who was going to take care of me? Where was I going to go? What was going to happen to me? So they were all worried about the, all these things that were happening. So instead of putting me in school, they, they just would tell me, stay in the car. You know, the only time you need to get out is when you have to go to the back. That's it. And I would stay in the car all day in the hot Amer- yeah. uh, Arizona sun. 
Oh my and, gosh. Um, yeah. yeah. And I did that for a while. And then and eventually they just, people would keep telling them, you need to put her in school. You need to put her in school. So eventually they, they and when they saw that they weren't being caught and they weren't going to get deported or nothing was going to happen to them immediately, that's when they said, okay, you know, we're going to go ahead and put her in school. And this was like after the summer, because I remember it was August when I went, when I started kindergarten. And, um, and so then uh, I uh, was able to go into kindergarten about a few, a few months later in, I started learning my numbers, my letters. And um, I had a really, I made really good friends. Um, there was this, I wish I could remember her name. I, I could barely remember her face, but she was so wonderful. Um, mm. I remember um, meeting her and she had um, Skittles. <laughs> and she would she would give me Skittles every time I said the color right. <laughs> That was a great motivator. You remember, you remember that? <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I was like, yes. And so I was like, what color is this? I'm like, red. Yes, this is yellow. And so then I started developing the, you know, my, my vocabulary in English. And that became the way that I started picking up English really fast. I was around English in school. I was around kids that spoke English in school, playing with kids that spoke English. So it was really quick for me. And I was a little kid. Mm-hmm. And and now I realize that languages come easy to me too, yeah. because um, it it did help me a lot. And so, and so then by the by that after that, um, my um, um, my um, they would they would my parents would would be called to the school. And this, I don't know if you remember in the eighties. Um, you might be too young for this, <laughs> but the, in the eighties, um, there there was a program for McGruff the dog. Oh about, yeah, yeah. I like, remember McGrath. About yeah. neighborhood watch. The police, yeah, yeah, the about police neighborhood, neighborhood watchdog. Yeah. 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 And so then they would have meetings and they would invite us to go and my parents had no idea what was going on, but we would go. <laughs> <laughs> we would go because they would give away cookies and coffee. <laughs> so we would go and they would tell, you know, like they're like, Okay, we need you to pay attention because when we come home you're gonna tell us what they said. <laughs> so I was like, Okay. It helped though because it was McGruff and I was like, Yeah, I'm gonna pay attention to that. So I did, and I, and I would give him like a summary. Of course, I don't know how a lot of things that were probably weren't correct, but I, you know, I did my best, and I would tell them. And um, so that's how I started developing and started becoming an interpreter for my mom. Um, also, when they, they would call her for parent-teacher meetings at the school, mm-hmm. she would say, you know, tachi, which means what, what? What is? What are they saying? What's happening? Like tachi, tachi. And so I would tell her. I would say she's saying this and. She's saying, and an excellent student. <laughs> <laughs> that might, I might have, you know, embellished a little bit. Yeah, yeah, but, <laughs> understandable. But, um, and what, and what, what languages? What, what languages did did your 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 parents speak? And 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 remind me how many languages you Aca- you speak currently? Acateco. Mm-hmm. Um, my my we were always born into uh, the Acateco community, and. Um, so my parents, both of them, speak that. My dad does speak another language because he did move into an area where they speak another language, and he's picked it up, and that's why I've been able to practice with him. Um, but myself, myself, um, I speak four of the indigenous languages. I don't speak them fluently. Um, which which languages? I speak, them, I, um, I speak uh, Kankuban. Mm-hmm. Um, Akateko, of course, is my first language. And then I speak Popti. And from a, on a certain area, and then um, which is where my dad lives now, and um, and um, also to um, also a certain area because it's closer to where I I'm from, and I've always been around. Uh, whenever we would work, um, we always were around that community also, so that's that's why it was easy for me yeah. to pick it up. And then of course you speak Spanish and, and English, so so a total of six languages. <laughs> Right. I would say nine, oh. <laughs> um, but because um, I do love French and I I love okay. Portuguese also. But but I mean I understand more than I can speak back, and that's where I say I'm, it's, a lot of the languages I'm I'm not fluent in because I can understand them a lot, but like just being able to speak back enough is not is is just barely just to get by. It's not going to be like fluent like me and ha- having a yeah. like a conversation like you and I right now in in Portuguese. I might be able to yeah. answer one or two things, but not everything. Yeah, yeah. I speak I speak a little bit a little bit of Portuguese too. My my wife tell, says that I I don't speak that Portuguese well enough to say that, but you know, I, a little a little bit enough to get by. Oh, I mean, I can I can get I can get your name. I can get your like how, mm-hmm. you know how old you are. You know, are you married or you're not? Do you have children? Like I I can get through all that, but 
but once it gets heavier, I'm, I'm not going to say I can understand it, but I can't, I can't respond. Another question that I know is going to be really, really valuable for, for a lot of Spanish interpreters here in the United States, as well as, as monolingual English only speaking providers here in the United States when working with, working with the, the Mayan community, right. As yeah. far as how to, how to still provide health equity when the, some of the languages they're, they're not as familiar with, and it's a culture that they're maybe not as familiar with. So my, my question for you is what, what are some of the, the, the basic information that, that providers need to need to know about when working with and when requesting an interpreter so you can understand, make sure they get the language right. They don't just assume that it's Spanish. What, what do they need to know? Medical providers need to know um, when working with uh, the Mayan community. Well, um, my wish is that everybody would realize what you and I know because you and I are in, in the in the in 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 hospitals and around mm-hmm. interpretation all the time. So you and I know that Spanish and Mayan are different. Mm-hmm. But I'll be honest with you, I've had very educated people not know that and so um the number one thing is to once the person tells you if they're not from mexico that they are from guatemala then understand that there are 22 indigenous mayan indigenous languages spoken in guatemala aside from that there's also xinca and garifuna so there's 24 languages that are different that are of not Spanish spoken in Guatemala. That's the number one thing. We need to understand that in Guatemala, as small as the country is, there are 24, aside from English and Spanish, because also English and Spanish is, is spoken in, in, the, in, in Guatemala. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just need to understand that, that once we understand that in Guatemala, all these languages are spoken. And, and there are different and, and that they are second and that Spanish is a second language. That is one thing that we really have to understand. The, you know, Spanish is very second because a lot of times they say, oh, but, you know, they were able to answer when I said what, what their name was. Mm-hmm. They were able to tell me, um, you know, like they're hurting here. Right. Yes, that is true. But that doesn't mean that they understand the, the language fluently. And I can tell you from my own experience, I still struggle with Spanish because Spanish has so many rules. You yeah. know, there's there's so many rules for Spanish. And so then as an indigenous language speaker, I still struggle with it sometimes because mm-hmm. it's not my number one. It's not my number two. It's actually my number six language that I have in my roster of languages. <laughs> So, in your large it, you know, roster. even, yeah. Yeah, even, even having all that and even knowing everything yeah. that I know, I still struggle with it. So that's one, the number one thing that we need to understand. Just because I say I speak it, just because I say I right. understand it, it doesn't mean that I do it fluently. If you, if you said something that was completely new to me, different to me, and I'm not an interpreter, I wouldn't know how to say it. I, I wouldn't know. Mm-hmm. And it could mean something as simple as epidermis, you know, mm-hmm. but, but I don't know it. So because I don't know it, I'm going to be lost. And I might say, yeah, I understand you. Because I'm embarrassed to say I don't, but you know that's one number one thing we need to understand. So the yeah. second thing that I would like people to understand is that so as soon as you find out that the person is from Guatemala and that they indeed speak an, an, a Mayan language, um, then the work that needs to be done is to find out where they're from. A lot of times, uh, my my. Um, Brothers and sisters don't know the name of our language. And also because the names of our languages are not the names that you hear. For example, Acateco is not Acateco to us. To us, Acateco is T-A. That's it. And so then if I say, if you say, you know, let's say, David, you say to me, so, okay, what language do you speak? And I say, T-A. Okay, T-A. So then you come back to me. You know, the now the agency, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. you say, this person said they spoke TA. And now, so then, the, so then now you and I are kind of lost because, okay, I really don't know where TA is from. You know, like, I don't, I, I know, like, let's say I don't know, you know. Mm-hmm. 
And so then the, the next best thing to ask is where they're from. Right. So let's not assume that they know the name of the language. So then now let's say, where are you from? So once we have that, if the agency gets all their information correct, they will pinpoint the language right away within seconds. Not all, not everybody is like that. I understand that. And, and that's why in, you know, um, smaller agencies like, like mine, we focus on that. We really focus on that. We educate all the coordinators so that they know that once they say this person is from here, or even if they just ask their name, we kind of know right away because I've taught them that. Right. But that's something that I can't teach everybody, you know, not, not everybody's going to want to learn all that. And that's a lot, it's a lot of information. So number one, finding out persons where they're from. Number two, um, seeing if they at least know the name of what the language they speak. So mm-hmm. that's, uh, that's golden, you know, like two pieces of golden information that, that are really important. And never, and never assuming that they, they speak Spanish. And so, and, and I think that's, that. that that's a, that's a big question that I, I hear that comes up a lot is because the, the providers many times might ask. And so do you also speak Spanish? Right. And so mm-hmm. what's the best way to determine their level of Spanish? Because many, many times there might be some Spanish, right? But that's not their native language. And so i sometimes it, it, it feels like there is a rush to, as soon as you hear that, that there's, that there's a little bit of Spanish that the patient might speak, then, okay, great. So then we can send a Spanish interpreter, right? So how mm-hmm. do we then determine the level of Spanish versus their potentially native language? Well, it's always going to be, you know, it, it, you and I know that, but mm-hmm. perhaps not all the providers will know that. But as soon as you know that that person is not answering to you in a formal Spanish mode, you know, like instead of saying, see, sí, usted, or, you know, like referring to you in a formal way, because that is something that you and I know that there's two versions of Spanish, right? There's the informal and then there's the very formal, formal Spanish, correct? So right. then once you kind of know, but see, this is information that we know that you and I know because we're, in, we're surrounded by languages every day, but that's something that'll give it away right away because they, they, they won't be able to express themselves in the formal Spanish. And even if they did, that still doesn't necessarily mean it. Like, there's there's a lot of people that are bilingual, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there that makes them uh, you know like an interpreter, right? How do we determine that? So then they have to go to an exam, they have to do certification. There's so many other things that are involved in that. But for the for the quickest method is that is just how are they refer, how are they answering back to you? You know, like mm-hmm. do they when you say <clears throat> you know how high is your pain? You know, dolor. And, and, and do they say, you know, ah, pues, you know, mire, señor doctor, que me duele acá, you know, like, and sí. they, and they say it like in a formal way, or do they just say aquí, you know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. aquí, and that's it. They don't really go anywhere else. And there's no, yeah. there's, they don't explain like, oh yeah, you know, it's mi abdomen, it's the dolora, you know, like everything, like they go into a long conversation regarding where they're in pain because that's what someone does in their name you know when they're right. fluent right right and so then that would be a really good yeah that's um, a really that's a method. really good point so if mm-hmm. if they're if you're asking the patient you know describe to me your symptoms and they they just mm-hmm. point and say you know aquí instead of mm-hmm. explaining what you would be able to do of course in your in your native native tongue so so that's mm-hmm. a really good 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 sign and also being able to ask ask them right and what mm-hmm. what 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 language do you prefer right yeah being able to well, i mean and, and, and instead of saying prefer i would just say usted habla otro idioma mm-hmm. Está bien si habla otro idioma. it's okay if you do you know like mm-hmm. making them you know feel that it's fine for them to to say that they do um and, it, and it's going to happen also like if they're if you're telling them okay you're going to have an mri then you're going to have this and you're going to have that and they're just like wow that's a lot you know, like you yeah. can tell you can tell right away there's just no response or, or it's just, um, it, it's just confusion, you know, and, and that is a dead giveaway. I mean, they're telling you, I don't, <laughs> yeah, you're talking to me, but I really don't understand everything you're telling me. And I know we're in a hurry, especially in the medical setting, 
decisions have to be made in, in, in seconds, but right. but it is important for them to know because I've, I've interpreted for people uh, many times and in, in my entire experience, I've, I've interpreted for many people that sometimes that when they get asked, okay, so you know why you're here, right? And they get it, they get that asked, They've, they've asked them. They've even told them, you're going to get this done. You're going to have this. You're going to have this. And then finally, they're like, you know what? This person's really not responding to us. Mm -hmm. Let's get an interpreter involved. And they do when they ask them that question. You know why you're here, right? No, I don't. I just know that I had pain. I came to the hospital and I've been here since. Yeah. And so they didn't even know why they were still there. Yeah. And, and one of the things you, you were touching on in that, that example, if the provider is giving a bunch of instructions, like, okay, you're going to go go to this department, then you're going to go get an MRI, and then you're going to take this, this medication. My my question is, is do you come across as well? Because I've experienced this before where I was interpreting to interpreting in Spanish to someone who was then interpreting, who spoke Spanish and in another, in another language. Um, I don't know if it was Kanjoval or which the other language was. I don't remember, but they were then interpreting that into the the, nat the native language, and there were some words that didn't exist in the same way that they existed in Spanish, even. Yeah. So, well, yeah. I so, mean, how often do you come across so across that, and how do you how do you um, help again providers understand the 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 differences there with with the language? Well, I mean, just just know that our languages are very old, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and we have another colleague that I always speak to about this too. And um, she brings up a really good, important point. And she tells me, you know, like when we were all colonized, right? Our, basically our civilization or our environment at that point kind of just came to a standstill. And so then there was no more, you know, it, you, know the, you, you were worried about surviving. You weren't worried about, you know, I need to learn this. I need to learn that. I need to know what this is for. We stayed in our own environment. Yeah. And so then when that happens, then, you know, there's no, like, computer is even hard to explain. MRI, you know, I've always right. given this as a really good example. And it's true. I mean, like, there is no word for MRI, you know, like, you know, in Spanish there is, but in, mm -hmm. in our language, no. So then, you know, the way I describe, I have to describe it. I tell them you're, it's a machine that you're going to go into. That machine is then going to make some turns and it's going to go around you. And then it's whatever the area they're looking for, it, that's what they're going to take a picture of. Mm -hmm. And they're going to, after that, then the, you will be leaving that machine. And then after that, they're going to give you, uh, you know, like if, if, if the provider is telling them that then they're going to give you the, the, the results, right? But I have to tell them it's a machine that you go into right. and then describe almost what the machine does. And that's, what, that's where the education for interpreters comes in. Like, if I have to know what an MRI does so that I can describe it. I have to know what a catheter is. I have right. to know what it's used for. When is it used for? A G two, all these, you know, all these things we have to know. Mm -hmm. Not just know them because it's written and this is the definition. No, we have to see how it's done so that we can describe that. And that's where that's that's where it makes a difference for us, especially in the indigenous languages, um, because it, 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 our languages are described. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's and it's good for providers to know that, so that if they are <clears throat> talking about about CAT scans, CT scans, MRIs, things like that, that may, may not have a direct wording, that they can also help help the interpreter by, by giving the description, then the interpreter can, can interpret the, uh, the description as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it helps a lot that when they, they simplify, like they, mm -hmm. you know, like they, you know, like instead of just using um, medical terminology 100%, right. perhaps they can just kind of, they say, oh, okay, I understand that this language you know, is it a lot of the things ha have to be explained? So then, I'm going to say instead of saying MRI, I'm going to say I am going to say MRI, but I'm going to kind of describe what it does. Yeah, that would be great. That's in a perfect world. That would be oh my goodness, that's so helpful for us because then it helps us, um, you know, under, um, be able to render what information they're saying. Um, but but in but but when it, everything is so quick, it's it is hard, mm -hmm. you know. But it is important for other, if uh, other interpreters are listening that speak indigenous languages. One of the best things to do is just to 
know and understand these things. If you're going to do medical interpreting, okay, you can get to know everything that is about medical interpreting from something as simple as poking your finger to to get a drop of blood so that you can do an exam to all the way to something, you know, like a um, heart or a transplant, yeah. all, all these things. Yeah. And, and talking about, about, in, about interpretation here in the, in the United States for, for mine and, and indigenous languages, do you know the, 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 the data on how many, how many interpreters there are? Throughout the mm. throughout the no. United States that are that would um, that that are, are Mayan interpreters currently or in the state of Florida where you're at? No, it's it's hard to say. No. Um, and, and there are more now. There are more well, thank, now than, to you. than they were yeah. in the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm glad I paved the way for a lot of people so that they can come into this world and help others because. Um, when I started, of course, there was just very few of us. And, and one of the people that actually mm-hmm. helped me into learn more about interpreting and everything, um, he passed away. So then, you know, like then there's that, that kind of information and resource left mm-hmm. with him, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, um, but, but yeah, I mean, we're, I don't, I can't, I, I really can't answer that question and, yeah. and, and I don't want to give misinformation out sure. there, but I know that now there's more. And so there are a lot more people um, doing this kind of work. When I when I heard you speak, you know, a couple of again a couple of years ago in the Atlanta Interpreter Conference, you were talking about how you have helped pave pave the way for for so many mind language interpreters. And so I'd I'd love for the for the audience to learn a little bit more about what what you have done specifically to help train interpreters, and so that so that these patients do have access to professional medically trained interpreters in in their language um can you talk us talk us through a little bit about what what you've been able to do there absolutely well um number one was you know having found founded a organization or an agency that provides those services when i saw that there was a need and like and so many i mean and i'm not going to talk bad about anybody Mm because we're all we all have our specialties right yep but when you're dealing with indigenous languages and there's so many things involved with them, it is the, it is best practice to get to know that. Get to know them. Don't just call me and say, I need a Mayan interpreter. Yeah, there's a lot of us, but which language is it? Where is, where is this person from? Um, which, you know, which branch of the language do they speak? And with all the variants and, you know, like that's important information that everybody should, if you're going to provide these languages, you please work on that because it is very important because it helps the patient or the, whoever that it, you're providing interpretation for, it helps them a lot. And so that was the number one thing that I had to do is, find, you know, like have a, even, you know, we're, we're still small and, but the, thing that I always focus on is that is to yeah we may be small but we want to provide the best you know like we want to get it right Mm -hmm. and if we don't please feel free to tell me no it's not I need this okay so then we're going to work on that and so going you know like having uh, my interpreters and then um, after my interpreters and starting to look for people that have the talent that that they speak it and they understand it, but that it's not as simple as that. But, you know, I have my own evaluation, you know, I have my own method of how to evaluate the, the, the ability of this person to be an interpreter. Um, in the beginning, I, you know, I, I'm, you know, just like anybody else, we, you know, you make a lot of mistakes and, and you try to do it the fastest way possible, but it's not that, you know, then we, we were able to then, um, make it, you know, make new changes and, and then help more people so that they can now, you know, like now the ones that are in, in you know, working with us now, they're, they're completely, um, you know, taught and they, and they, they have to continue um, getting trained. We, we have gone as far as hiring people and having them um, teach and then, you know, like an entire weekend or an entire week. Um, we, you know, we've done things like that so that they can have the training that they need because and a you, lot of and people, your, your organization provides that uh, training, correct? Yeah, yeah. 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 
I mean, like, um, you know, let's say I'll get a group of 20 interpreters and, um, and, and, and I'll, and I'll tell them, you know, cause I'm going to need a week of your time. You're they're going to, you're going to be in, in front of a, 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 someone from eight until five and you're going to learn all the, everything that is important. Ethics. Number one, that's the number one mm-hmm. thing I always go with. Ethics, 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 protocol, everything that you need to know as an interpreter. That's the number, you know, like those are the things that we focus on in, when, when you, when you start. But then after that, you know, that it starts branching out and new diabetes education, um, you know, you know, everything that has to do with, um, interpreting, we, 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 we have hired people so that they can teach our, um, with technology now, you know, like you can, it can be done over Zoom and the, the trainer can be in California and the, all the interpreters can be yeah. in, in their own city. And so then, you know, it's, it's, it's possible. It just, it, it just takes time and you have to have a passion for it. You have to really want to get it right so that you can do that. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's clear that you have that, that passion for, for educating, for, for training, for helping, helping increase the, the pool of, uh, of my language and in, interpreters and um, seeing, seeing the numbers of, of individuals that you've, you've personally helped train is, is remarkable. And it's, um, it's helping so many, so many people and really helping in, improve uh, health equity throughout, throughout the country. So we're grateful, grateful for what you're doing and, and, and want to want to encourage others to, um, to reach out to you for, for those, those training opportunities. Can you share with us a little bit more about what those training opportunities might look like if someone was wanting to get involved with you? So, yeah, if you speak an indigenous language, um, language, first you have to determine like which, which, you know, would you want to go with medical or do you want to go with legal? So, if you you know, depending on which one you go with, then that's when that's where we start your training. Um, if you already have some training, you know, in, in your background, you know, you already speak it out and you've done your own homework. Great. You know, and then we'll go to the next level with mm-hmm. you then. You know, like there's certain there's several um, tiers that we have to determine where that person falls. And then that's where we start training for them. Um, one of the one of my success stories is um, is a young lady that is, you know she speaks Zacateco, mm-hmm. and I met her because she was helping uh, in interpret for her grandfather, and I was like, wow, you know, like I you know I really I really commend you for doing this. Uh, I know you're really young. She was still in high school but this, this at this time, and um, she um, and I told her I said never forget our language. Keep going with it. And so then when she turned um, 18, she looked me up and mm-hmm. I kind of started um, helping her and kind of guiding her. And I, and I started inviting her to some of the trainings that we did in, within my interpreters. But then I also told her about other organizations that are holding trainings also. And she did it. And now she's one of her really best, um, you know, Akateko interpreters. Wow. And she speaks directly into English. And that's the, one, you know, the most wonderful thing in Mm. to find and and so there are people like that there's a lot of people out there that will be listening to this podcast and that they have that um dream that they mm-hmm. want to help their community so this is this is one of the ways that you can excellent well and we'll definitely provide your your information as well for um for your company maya interpreters so that people that are wanting to get that type of training can can reach out out to you directly um another question question for you carmelina is You've your story is so so powerful for for all of us who are listening, and your story of resilience and and determination to you know against all odds do what you you've been able to do. What is it that today you know gets you up out of bed in the morning, and, and what's the impact that you're you're wanting to leave the the world? I I want I want someone, and it, it, it makes me. Um, it breaks my heart to hear, you know, like I feel good listening to what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I want to leave, when I, when I want to leave the future generation of indigenous children that are growing up here. And I also have something online um, that we, that I um, um, helped and uh, was an uh, editor slash um, advisor on um, um, a toolkit for teachers with indigenous children in their classroom. And, um, and when I, as I was doing that, uh, and that was my, my, my number one thing that gets me out of bed every day is that, is to be able to help one more person. 
you know, if, if all I do today is just help someone relay their story um, so that they don't go through what we went through. Because, you know, I, I gave you a summarized yeah. version of my story, of course. There's so much more behind that. Yeah. You know, I, there's so much more, so many more things I that I saw. That. Yeah. And so because of that, I, while, you know, as long as Carmelina Cadena is, is in, in, on the earth, that is what I want to do. I get up every morning so that we, one more person, one more um, a victim, one more, whatever your situation is, I want to be able to have someone that can give and tell your story for you, you know? You tell your story, but I'm saying like, re, you know, relay it, relay it into another language so that the lawyer or the doctor or the judge or the police officer or whoever it is that mm -hmm. you're in front of, so they can understand why you're going through that. Everyone has a story, but not everyone has the opportunity to be able to be understood in their own language about their story, to tell their story. Yeah. So that's what gets me out of bed every morning. I get up. You know, um, I have my routine and then I, and I just, that's, that's the number one thing I want to do. And as soon as I come in, uh, that's what I look at, that's, you know, what are we doing? You know, like, um, right now, um, we also started having uh, our own quality control within our own agency. So we have that and, um, we're, you know, and, and, and this is something that I would like everyone to know, like if you know someone and, and you feel that they, they um they would make an excellent interpreter send them our way please um you know we'll get them the correct training and even if they don't stay with us it doesn't matter as long as they have some foundation and they leave us that's great that's what i want you know i you know they don't have to be with me all the time they can be with whoever they want yeah. but i just want them to have that foundation so that when they go out there and they're providing the the best service possible wow now we're Th thank you so much, uh, Carmelina, for for sharing sharing your story, sharing a little bit of, of your story here with us, and um, it's just uh, it it fills fills me with, with with pride just to hear hear that there there are people like you that are just pouring out their their heart and soul that wake up every day wanting just to help that that one more person. What if we all what if we all lived our lives that way, right? It's a it's a great great lesson because it just starts with with one one person and the ripple effect that that you have right with helping that one person is is very powerful so um carmelina it's been such a such a blessing to hear hear from you today hear, hear a little bit about about your story hear about the the mayan community and what what we as interpreters need to know as well as uh, as medical providers need to know when when helping serve the the mayan community so you've given us some some really good specific actionable uh items as well so we're great, grateful for that. And um, what's the, uh, the what's the easiest way for people to to get a hold of you? Um, well, they can reach us at uh, myintroverse.com, and we have a place where you can go ahead and write. That email will come to our general email, but then if it's something that is directed toward me, it'll they'll they'll make sure I get it. Um, but that's the best way. Um, I'm also on Facebook. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Carmelina Cadena Acateco Interpreter. Um, so I think you can reach me there also. And also okay. my interpreters is on Facebook also. It's my interpreters or at Maya in USA. Um, okay. And you're on, you're on um, LinkedIn as well. And LinkedIn as yeah. well. Um, and I mean, I'm trying to cover all the, all the, <laughs> the social media. Yeah. I'm um, also, I just started my own, uh, TikTok. <laughs> oh, you did. Okay. What's, what's your, yes, what's I your, did. what's your handle? Carmelina dot Cadena. At, okay. You know, at, you know, yeah, at yeah. Carmelina dot Cadena. I'm doing right. that because, um, um, once this kind of settles down and we're back on, uh, on out, you know, interpreting, uh, in other States, I just started, um, I've already been out three times already. I've, been in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, I was just recently in Atlanta, Georgia, interpreting, um, and I also was in um, Texas. Um, it, you know, now during these times right now, that's for depositions, of course. Yeah. And um, so, you know, like I want to show, you know, like what does like a lot of people un misunderstand that, you know, like they're translator and interpreter. What you know, like we're not all translators. No, no, we're not. But, you know, like that's the reason that I started it so that we can get, you know, 15 seconds of your, you know, 15 seconds of yeah. your time. Boom. And then you learn something. Well, that's a great, about it's it. a great, great resource to, to have access to. I love I love that you're on TikTok. I've got to I've got to get on get on there myself. 
uh, and we'll we'll definitely have to go on there and 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 check and check you out. Um, yeah, I and, don't have a lot of content yet, but it's coming. <laughs> that's okay. That's all right. That's all right. You you, you will. Um, and just for for everyone else, thank you so much for for listening and, and joining in on uh, our conversation here with Carmelina. Uh, go go ahead and uh, if you haven't already, subscribe to 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 the podcast, whether that's on on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you're, you're listening from anchor. Um, and feel free to like, like the, like this, this podcast and share it with your, with your friends as well. We, we do this so that we can bring, bring awareness about medical interpretation so that we can raise the level of professionalism, uh, and, and ultimately take our industry to, to the next level and, and improve health equity through language access. So we, we need your support in that. And we, we also ask you if there's other topics that you want to hear, other questions you have, uh, let us know. And we'd love, love to hear that. And on a future podcast, we'll share those questions or have a, have a guest to be able to, to unpack that together. So thank you all so much for, for tuning in. And again, Carmelina, it was an absolute pleasure. Have a, have a wonderful day and, and we'll, we'll talk soon. Thank you very much, David. You have a wonderful day too. Thank you.